Hi, this is Robert Furrow, and welcome to Truth Quest Podcast. This is our Q&A, where we look at questions through the lens of Scripture. Our desire is to know what God's Word says so we can know what to believe, rightly dividing the Word of God. A lot of people approach the Bible to back up what they already believe instead of trying to figure out what the truth is. If you have a question, then you can submit your question through the comment section. Just write the word question and then uh, out first, follow it by your question, reread it a couple of times, make sure that it makes sense. You can also submit personal questions, questions about apologetics and the Bible. I'm not saying that I've got all of the answers, uh, but we'll be able to make our way through it and also submit the references and we'll be able to pull them up and take a look at them. All right. So our first question is connected to our service last Wednesday night. We were looking at Galatians chapter 5, where it talks about the liberty by which we stand. Stand, therefore, it says, Galatians 5.1, in the liberty that you have, that, that we have been given freedom by Christ. And we talked about using our liberty, that we are the most free, so we have freedom from death and freedom from sin, but also freedom to do whatever we want to do here. But we don't do everything we want to do because there are consequences. And we want good consequences and not bad consequences. So we want to walk in wisdom in all the things that God has given to us, in all the ways that God has given them. And the question came in, what about liberty and offenses? When people are offended because of something that you have liberty with. And this happens regularly. And the Bible tells us how to deal with it. When someone is offended by a liberty, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stop that liberty. But when someone stumbles because of that liberty, that's a whole other issue. If someone sees you taking a liberty and it leads them down a path that causes them to stumble, maybe even in Christ, then we are not living for others. I want to just show you a couple of passages. So um, we have, first of all, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and 24. It says, all things are lawful for me. There's that statement, but not all things are helpful. There we go. There are consequences and some things hurt. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. We want to do those things that edify us. It goes on to say, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. There's the key. In my freedom... I'm not just to consider myself, but I'm to consider other people as well. And if someone were offended by something that I found a freedom in, if I felt it was okay to watch Seinfeld, but I knew that someone else thought that it was sinful to watch it, if I invite them over to watch Seinfeld, that's not considering their well-being. Now, whether or not it's okay, you have to determine those things. It's a matter of conscience. It's a matter of liberty. It's a matter of what it might do in your life. And what might be okay for you to watch doesn't cause you to stumble, might cause someone else to stumble. It also says in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, but beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Now, it goes on to tell us that the weak ones are the ones who eat only vegetables. The weak ones are the ones who have more restrictions. Those who are strong have less restrictions, but we are to consider the weaker brethren again because we do not want him to stumble. I want to give you another one. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right, this is 1 Corinthians 14. I just want to read some of this. I don't want to read all of it, but you'll get the idea. It says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. There's the two different issues. The one that doesn't eat despises. The weak one despises because you're eating something his conscience says he shouldn't eat. And then you judge the other person the, and, and because they eat something that you would not want them to eat. Or don't despise the person who's weaker. It goes on to say, and let not him who uh, not let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another man's servant? So here's when we're talking about just offenses. If something that I am doing, my freedom, is offensive to you, that's one thing. If it causes you to stumble, that's another. So if you're doing something that I'm offended by, I'm thinking, how can he do that as a Christian? Instead of judging you, 
I should know that you are in Christ and maybe even pray for you if I think that there's something that's leading you into sin. The Bible says don't use your liberty as an occasion for the flesh. And so we can definitely do that. We want to use our liberty, the freedom that we have in Christ all the way into eternity, right? That's a wonderful freedom we have for things that edify and for things that are not going to cause other people to stumble because we are living for other people and not just for ourselves. And that's pretty important. It's really important that we live our lives in such a way that people around us are blessed by us and we are glorifying God in what we do. The Bible says these are the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And God has given us all things freely to enjoy, but there are boundaries that are set by the love that we have for one another and by whether or not it's edifying, by the consequences that may come in my life because it's not wisdom. All right, so thank you very much for the response to the study. It's good to see you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and take our questions. If you're new here, we want to welcome you. If you have a question, write the word question in front of it, or a Q, and then write out your question. I'll make my way through here, be able to see what the questions are, and um, we'll bring them in and we'll take a look at them. Uh, I, I pray that God uses this to really help edify us and even draw us closer together. So our first question comes from Rod. Uh, Rod says, who are the morning stars in Job 8, uh, 38, 7? Angels? I thought angels could not sing. If, if sons of God, why are they mentioned also? All right, well, Rod, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to try my new little system here that I've got. Um, Job 38, 7. We will see how this works. So it's Job, Job 38, 7. All right. This is going to take me a little bit to get good at this. Job 38. Woohoo! And this is New King James. Um, and I, this is, by the way, one of my favorite verses is, is this verse right here. It's um, pretty amazing. When the morning stars, st uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Um, what is the... Uh, what is the translation you were using that said sing for joy? Um, I do know there's a translation that says sing. All right, let's do something else. Let's pull up the Strong's and we'll take a look at what that word is. Um, but the morning stars, uh, the, the, um, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. So the sons of God are going to be angels. And we see that in the opening of the book of Job. So the sons of God are angels that have been created by God and they shout for joy, and oh, the morning stars sang together. Okay, duh. <laughs> I get a little confused myself. So the morning stars sing together. Um, I'm going to say that they're, you, the Bible tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. There's a hierarchy with angels and demons. Principalities seem to be the highest. And so we may have the sons of God shouting for joy and the morning stars singing together and them being higher spiritual beings. It's also thought that when it says the morning stars sang together, that there was some kind of a, of a song when God created the world, that everything kind of sang together. We know the world was created with wisdom and understanding. We know that math uh, itself does a lot of things uh, in our world and is involved in creation. God did so many complicated things when he made this world. That's absolutely amazing. So the morning stars singing together, some believe, is the background of, of music when God created things. Um, and maybe the stars themselves caused some kind of singing. Um, or it could be higher principalities among the sons of God who sang. Um, and I, uh, I have heard it said that angels do not sing, but... All they mean by that is the Bible never has angels singing. This may very well be a case of it. So when the angel appears to the, the shepherds in the field in Bethlehem, they say, you know, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill towards men. We, we want to say they sang it. So people will say, well, angels don't sing. Um, we don't know that. In fact, when you're giving a description of Lucifer, either in Ezekiel or Isaiah, it talks about the flute and the harp. And so it seems 
and some believe that Lucifer was a head of worship in heaven, that he was the worship leader in heaven. I don't know about that. I think that sometimes things get a little bit stretched, but it does talk about musical instruments. And um, just because we don't have angels singing in the Bible doesn't mean that they didn't sing, right? And so we just got to be careful that we make sure we make the right statement. So the right statement would be angels um, are not, we don't ever see angels singing in the Bible, unless, of course, the morning star there. All right, good um, good question, Rod, and good to see you. Um, we have another question from, and Andre, Andre, good to see you. Is one hour, Revelation 18, 17, and 19, New King James Version, one hour? Well, that's a good question. There are those things in Revelation that are literal, and there are things that are not literal. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the scriptures that we have here, and I will look up Revelation, was it 18? I gotta remember these things better when I'm doing this. Um, let me go ahead and take a look here and see. <clears throat> Andre, Revelation 18, 17, and 19, good. All right, so let's go ahead and get to 17 and 19, all right. <clears throat> so we've got the, well, let's see what it is. Let's see what the context is here. So the context is um, the world mourns Babylon's fall. All right. And in 17 and starting with 17, it says here, I'm going to go all the way through 19. Uh, For one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by the ships, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning. What it is like, what is like this great city. Then they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by its wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. All right. So um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Andre, I appreciate your question. Uh, it could be, meaning it happened very quickly, right? In one hour. I would have to take a look at other places in the Bible that the phrase in one hour was used. Was it a turn of phrase that they used in their day? And could it be that we would even use it in our day? Like the United States was destroyed in an hour. So this, this, this economic powerhouse came down quickly. We know that's what it means. Could it be literal and be an hour? Maybe. There are certain things that we'll find out when we get up into heaven. Um, I would not be surprised if it was metaphoric, uh, metaphorical there, that an hour didn't mean literally an hour, but just meant quickly. Uh, and But think about the world in their day. They become rich on Mystery Babylon. This economic system that rides on the beast and causes merchants at least to become rich and causes the world so much wealth and then all of their wealth is destroyed in an hour what an absolutely amazing passage uh thank you andre i appreciate that i'm not quite sure if it's literal or not but certainly it means that it's destroyed quickly and what a what an amazing thing it will be in that day when all of that economic freedom comes uh to naught so we have another question here from a uh, psych man 45 psych man. Good to see you. First time we enter the kingdom, we must knock Matthew seven, seven. Then Jesus gives us the keys so we can come and go. Or what do you say Jesus meant in John 10, nine? All right. So John 10, nine, let's, um, let me go ahead and let me go and let, let me look really quick at Matthew seven, seven. So, um, First time we enter the kingdom, we must knock. Matthew 7, 7. Let me take a look at that really quick. I'll go ahead and pull this up on the screen for you. You'll be able to look at that. All right, so it's the passage where it says, knock and keep knocking, um, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking. <laughs> some, of my, some, of my, some of my foam fell down. What did it do here? Ah, all right. I got some foam for my sound. Hopefully it sounds better because I just had the foam collapse on me. All right, so it says, ask uh, and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. All right, thanks. Um, and then uh, let's take a look at, we might as well do it right here as well. Let's take a look at John 10, nine. And we will compare them. 
John 10, 9. Sorry to do that while you're watching. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and I will go in and out and find, and he will go in and out and find pasture. Um, so he's the door and we enter and we go in and out. Uh, all right, psych man, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and get back here again. Um, and I'm not sure that these are connected. So um, you say the first time he says that we knock and we can make it into heaven. And Jesus did say, um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. But the knock and keep knocking, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking is perseverance. Perseverance in asking God, perseverance in seeking for God, perseverance in, um, in uh, what was the last one? Knock, seek, and um, knock, seek, and, and search, right? What does it say here? If anyone, eh, anyway, uh, you get the idea. Um, I don't know that this is connected to salvation. I don't know that we can connect the dots there. We want to take the the context of each one of them and compare them. And so uh, in, I'm trying to think of where it's at, where Jesus says, I, he says, on this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I give you the keys to the kingdom. So we are given to the keys of the kingdom to let other people in. It's not for us to be able to come and go, as far as I understand it. It's for us to be able to let people in. I've told people before, I have the keys to the kingdom. I can let you in. When someone says, pray for me that I go to heaven, I'll be, I have the keys to the kingdom. I can open the door. I can let you in. And the keys to the kingdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And we're guaranteed success. If we take the gospel, then people are going to get saved. And so um, John uh, 9, 10, where Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So he's picturing himself as a shepherd. As I understand sheepfolds in their day, they didn't have a door, the outdoor sheepfolds, they bring them in at night and the shepherd would lay across as the door. He says, come unto me, I'm the door and you enter in and you're gonna come in and out and find pasture. He's comparing us to sheep, having him as our shepherd and him leading us and we're gonna be taken to pasture. So that's what uh, he's talking about there in um, in John 10, nine. Let me, read it, let me get it up here again and we'll read it. So he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So you can only be saved by going through Jesus and will go in and out and find pasture. Then he goes on to say, and this is a great verse, the thief does not come except to kill, steal and destroy, but I have come to give you life and that they may have life more abundantly. That's connected to him being our shepherd. And we discover what the real abundant life is. And um, what, what a powerful section. All right, so thank you, Psych Man. I appreciate that. And I um, appreciate you. Uh, we'll go ahead and take our next question. If you're joining us here for the first time, good to have you here. Uh, I hope you are being blessed. I uh, just hope God's blessing you in general. If you have a question about I don't anything, your personal life uh, when it comes to your Christianity or a struggle that you might have or something that's going on between you and someone else, something that you might go to a pastor and ask them about, then feel free to ask questions like that as well as maybe hard and difficult questions or, or biblical passages that you might have questions about. All right, so we have a question here from Kimberly. Kimberly, good to see you. She says, hi, Pastor, hello. Uh, will we have to deal with temptation in heaven or the millennial kingdom? If a third of the angels fell, could we fall in heaven too? Yeah, I thought about this before myself, Kimberly. Um, so first of all, will we have to deal with temptation up in heaven? The answer to that is no. Uh, we are going to have our glorified bodies and our sin nature is going to be no more. And I guess even if we are tempted, we don't have a sin nature to go along with that temptation. Because in our glorified bodies, we are glorified with him. I don't believe we'll have the opportunity to be able to fall like the angels did. The angels were created and created with choice. Some of them choose to fall from glory. We were created with choice and we could choose to move into glory. It's just an amazing thing that the angels were there and they could get prideful like we could. There are similarities. We don't think of this often between us and the angels. We have choice. They have choice. They have pride. We have pride. The same kind of things um, can be happening and, and do happen. Um, what about the millennial kingdom? Remember, we're resurrected. So 
when we enter into the millennial, the millennial kingdom, we'll be ruling and reigning with Jesus. And um, we are already glorified. That rapture happened before the millennium. And the, no, ma no matter what your position is on the rapture, you've got to believe that there is one because the Bible says that we are going to be caught up and meet the Lord with the air. The dead are going to rise first and they'll forever be with the Lord. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, uh, behold, I give you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but some of us will be changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. That all happens before the millennium period. And you and I don't have um, the problems that go along with that. All right. Oh, and um, one thing, um, if a third of the angels fell in heaven, uh, we fall, will we fall in heaven too? Please say no. Uh, yes, I, I believe that we cannot fall. So I believe that's correct. That'd be a real drag. We make it through here. We persevere to the end and we get saved and we get up into heaven and we're like, I think I want to sin. And we go and we sin and we fall away from Christ. Or I think I'm a pretty great person. I think I'm greater than God, like Satan did. Um, what a tragedy that would be if that were the case. Right. So thank you very much, Kimberly. I appreciate that. All right. So we have a question here from Fact Check These Hands. Fact Check These Hands says, question, is there a right or wrong way to pray when asking God to lead my unsaved friends to Jesus? All right. That's a good question. Um, let's consider, first of all, is there a right or wrong way to pray? So we could pray selfishly. We could pray seeking our own way. We could pray. Um, there's certainly wrong ways to pray. To pray for your friends, your unsaved friends, to lead them to Jesus. Um, I mean, I think you could go to the extreme and find some wrong ways to pray. Like God, make them be saved, right? Make them choose you. God's not going to make them choose him, <laughs> at least not if you're not reformed. If you're reformed, then God makes everybody choose him. But if you're not reformed, <clears throat> then you don't pray that God would make someone choose him because that would take away their freedom of choice. And if that were the case, then we could cause anybody to get saved. So let me, let me rework your question a little bit. How can we pray that is going to be the most effective for winning people to Christ? And I think there's a couple of things here. First of all, we ask and keep asking. We continue to pray for them. And we ask that God would open up doors for us to be able to share. And if not us, then someone else to be able to share Christ with them. We ask that God would grant them eternal life, that God would work in their lives. And when we pray, it makes a difference. And I really believe that. And so I do believe there is a more effective way and less effective way to pray for someone and um, praying for them to come to Christ and be saved is the first thing that we want to do because we want to see people come to Christ. God desires all would be saved and all would come to the knowledge of the truth. All right. So thank you. Fact check these hands. I appreciate that. Uh, we have a question from Jari. Jari says, question, are the cherubs four-faced creatures I have heard that they have the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of a man, which is correct. Uh, is this synonymous or literal? Is it symbolism or synonymous? Each face was exactly the same thing. No. Um, some, uh, is this symbolism or literal? Is this like the Trinity? No. Um, all right. Thanks, Jari. Um, all right. So first of all, no, this is not like the Trinity. Uh, the creatures are being described. And when you look at the descriptions in the different places, they're slightly different. And so this would give us them as they were looking at it, describing what they were like. And they had these features. And the cherubim seemed to have those features. And if you really want to break it down, you want to say, how is the cherubim like a man? How is the cherubim like an eagle? How is the cherubim like an ox? And how is the cherubim like a lion? Right? If these are the four questions that are out there, how does the cherub, are the four faces there? What does it speak of and how does it speak of them? And they fly around and these, these cherubs that cry out, holy, holy, holy. And the doorposts are shaken. It is so loud. Some people complain about loud music in church. 
Well, it's going to be loud in heaven with these angels actually shaking the doorpost as they cry out how holy, how complete, total, holy God is and, um, and righteous our God is. So um, it's not like the Trinity. I think, is it, um, is it symbolism or literal? Were they seeing something that was symbolic or literal? I've always taken it as literal. And when you ask questions like that, it makes me go, well, I don't know. Maybe it is symbolic. Maybe they're symbolic of something and they're not literal. Maybe they were seeing something that gives it symbolic. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that's what these creatures look like. And it's kind of strange. And maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's what I think. Which will tell you when I say that's what I think that maybe it isn't so sure, right? Because uh, we can see and think certain things. But the cherubim and the seraphim, seraph is a burning one, but don't think of it like a fire. A seraph was a snake, a poison snake that bit someone and burned them, that the poison burned them. And so seraphim seems to be some kind of a serpent, deadly serpent, which is connected to angels. And that some think that perhaps Lucifer was a serpent in the garden, was a seraphim, if indeed seraph is the term that was being used for a burning one, a poisonous snake. And it is. It, it's used at times for a poisonous snake, if that's exactly what it means. All right. So some interesting stuff there. Uh, so um, Kay has a question. Kay, good to see you. Kay says, question, did pride already exist considering Satan seemed to be growing in pride? because he was wanting <clears throat> to be above God, does that mean he was having a problem with it for a, th a third of the angels fell? Does that mean he was having a problem with it for a third of the angels fell? All right, thank you. Um, did pride already exist? Yeah, I think, okay, I think as soon as God made us and made the angels, that there was the ability for pride, that we could think more of ourselves than we should that we see ourselves better than we are, or we see other people not as good as what we are. And all of that would be pride. And since Satan could fall in pride, then we could fall in pride as well. Then pride is just happened when we were created, when humans were created. Adam and Eve dealt with a little bit of pride as well. I think part of their sin was the pride of life. Um, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was desirable to make one wise. <clears throat> so I think that that's part of it. And um, so I do think that pride already existed. Um, it's the original sin. And if it's the original sin, then it's something that we want to humble ourselves so that God can exalt us. And we know that God is against the prideful. And so we want to make sure that we do fight it. The Bible clearly tells us that this is not something that we can deal with God. And if there is any pride in us, then reveal it to us, that we might be able to walk with you the way that we're supposed to. All right. So thank you very much uh, for your question. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. If you're new here, then uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, you can ask a question, any question you want to about the Bible, about Christian living, about prophecy, about apologetics, and uh, we'll take our best look at trying to look at it. Um, and uh, yeah, I see, Kay, that you thought Lucifer was the angel of music, and it may very well be. Um, if someone wants to take a look at that passage, um, I think it's the Ezekiel passage, um, then we can take a look at it and see whether we think so or not as we read it. All right? So here we go. Uh, we have a question from, uh, looks like, Kalen, Kalen says, explain why the Greek is different between NIV and New King James in Philippians 1, 7. Text says God in NIV. All right, well, let's take a look at that. Let me pull it up here. Philippians, um, Philippians 1, 7. Let's read it first of all in the, yeah, let's read it first of all in the New King James. I might be able to bring in the NIV as well. So let's see what I can do here. All right. So first of all, uh, it says here in verse seven, just as it is right for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both my chains and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, 
you are all partakers with grace, with me and grace. All right, let me just check the reference here. Did I get that right? Philippians 1, 7. Philippians 1, 7. All right, so the NIV says God. Let's, let me go ahead and see if I can get over to the NIV. Oh, it may take me a minute to get down here. There's a lot of different versions of the Bible. So, um, NIV, yeah. All right. So now we have the NIV up. Uh, let me go ahead and, uh, and read it here. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, about all of you, since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel of all of the um, of all you share in God's grace with me. So there it is. Um, of all you share in God's grace with me. Let me go ahead and go back to the New King James. I'll take a look at this now again. So um, we go we go near the end there. You are all partakers with me of grace. Um, I'm not sure why the NIV added the word God there. I, um, I'm not sure it, it, it says anything different. Um, you are all partakers with me of grace. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Um, I would like to look at it really quick in the King James Version, in the Strong's, and let's see if there's a word there that might correspond to God. It takes me a little bit to get my Strong's up here. Philippians 1, 7. All right, so here it is. Let me go ahead and bring it up for you. Um, Even as it is meant for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds, chains, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, all are partakers of my grace. Um, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say there's something different. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's something different in some manuscripts. So the New King James and the King James come from, I think it's the Texas Receptus, which is a, a certain manuscript that was around in, in um, 1611, when they made the King James Version. And um, then, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring up this here too while I'm talking about this. Um, and then there were other manuscripts that were found. And there are other manuscripts besides those that were back there in those days as well. But there are other manuscripts that were found. And the NIV relies heavily on newer manuscripts where the, the, the King James and New King James is the complete Textus Receptus. And I, and I believe that's the, the right one. Um, let me go ahead and go to Philippians. I'm going to look up and see if there's any footnotes on this. Philippians um, 1. And um, this is a really neat feature. In, um, and this is Bible uh, Gateway, is that you can see cross-references and footnotes. So we go to verse 7. And let's see, do I have footnotes on? Let me just go up here and check. Make sure, click on the little cog. Yep, everything's on. Um, let me go back to verse seven and see what's there. Um, just as it is right for me. Uh, 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 gosh, there's no footnotes in it. There's no footnotes in this chapter, in this verse. Um, let me change it to the NIV and see if there's footnotes in the NIV. All right. So, um, new international version. Oh, we got to do it down here. NIV, NIV, NIV. What am I missing? What am I missing? There it is. Nope, that's it. There you go. That's it. All right, NIV. All right, so we got cross-references here. Um, in verse 7, uh, it says, let's see what this is. That's just Philippians 1.16. That's a cross-reference. Um, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have any more cross-references. It doesn't have a footnote. Cross-reference, cross-reference. Huh. Well, uh, sorry, I wasn't able to be more helpful. I thought for sure we could chase this down, um, but it looks like we're not going to be able to. Um, I'm just going to have to take a guess here, and my guess is, um, Carlin or Kalen, my guess is that there are different manuscripts, and in one of some of the manuscripts it says God, and in some of the manuscripts it doesn't. 
when they were making the NIV, they had to make a decision which manuscript uh, they were going to use. I like, I like the King James and New King James a little bit better than the NIV. Um, I think most people feel that way. They feel like there were some liberties taken. It doesn't mean they're wrong in what they're doing. It doesn't mean that in, 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 in a good study Bible, there are um, footnotes that will tell you when there is, and I wish I had my actual study Bible here with me because I could open it up and see if there's any footnotes in there. Um, and it would tell you the difference. And if they were going to do something different like that, they should have footnoted it, which would tell you the majority of the manuscripts say God here or something along those lines. <clears throat> I think it's interesting, though, both of them are accurate. All right. So a little bit of a, of a word study there and um, unsuccessful in being able uh, to come up with uh, with the answer to that. All right. So sorry about that. Um, all right. So we have another question from Kay. Kay says, question, my son is always asking, what is a sign of Jesus coming back? I've told him everything and he is a believer, but with OCD. He is stuck in the fear mode and thoughts on what will claim, what will claim him. All right, let me see if I can kind of get your question figured out here completely. Um, okay, I think you are, my son always asking what the sign of Jesus coming back is. I've told him everything. So you've told him about the nation of Israel. That's God's major sign of the last days. <clears throat> Jerusalem being trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And then the end comes, um, and then he's got OCD, so he just gets these thoughts stuck in his mind, and he's worried what will, oh, um, let's see, any thoughts on what will calm him? There you go. All right, just takes me a little bit. Sometimes, sorry, Kay. Um, I've told him everything, and he's a believer, but with OCD, and he's stuck on, in the fear mode. Any thoughts that will calm him? Um, <clears throat> oh, boy. So OCD is, um, yeah, certain, there's different kinds of OCD. There's, there's the, the, the ritualistic where they got to go through rituals. You know, you got to straighten things up sometimes. Sometimes you got to go through, through certain rituals. Sometimes something happens in someone's head and they've got to repeat certain things over and over again once something is said. And um, again, the obsessive part of it, just get caught in something. And so he's thinking about the Lord coming back and he's just getting caught in it. Um, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So I'm thinking about bringing spiritual principles in here, okay? Um, letting him know that he's in Christ as a believer and that Jesus came to give him life abundantly. Go to some of the positive passages, maybe to be able to help his mind settle down. Um, all right. Uh, it's, um, when, when you're dealing with any, any kind of a mental issue, whether it's this or something else, uh, then you want to be praying and asking the Holy Spirit to help you. You want to be very understanding and you know that you want to be very understanding, um, and he'll be able to get unstuck. So, um, I assume since he's been diagnosed that he has a psychiatrist, um, and he might want to contact the psychiatrist and talk to them a little bit about it if he can't get unstuck, if he just stays <clears throat> in that fear mode and won't get out of it. Um, kind of a bad place to be. You and I could get scared about something and be able to get out of it, but what a hard place to be um, when, <clears throat> when you see yourself stuck in that. All right, Kay, so thank you very much for your question. I appreciate that, and um, I will be praying for your son as well, um, that he be able to get out of this and to think about whatever's pure and lovely and kind um, I know that's hard when you're dealing with someone who is struggling with OCD and very vulnerable. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we, we all need to know that just because we're Christians doesn't mean that difficulties and struggles don't happen to us or to those who we love. And that is very important. All right. So fact check these hands has a question. Um, is it sinful to spend money on shallow things? Example, getting my nails done instead of donating to ministry. No, it is not sinful. So the Bible says that God has given us all things to enjoy. The Bible says that those who have riches, not to trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God. So God's given you the 
the prosperity, the finances, the money that you have to be able to enjoy it. Does that mean you're not generous? I think particularly when we take a look at this question, can I spend it on um, on shallow things? There are certain women who wouldn't believe that getting their nails done is shallow, by the way. Uh, but um, getting my nails done instead of donating to ministry. And that's certainly shallow compared to donating to a ministry. You certainly want to be generous. And you can get your nails done and then be generous to the girl who does your nails or the woman who does your nails. Uh, you can also give to ministries and have your nails done. And if you don't have enough money to do both, then maybe you should be saving money, getting out of debt, doing the things that you have to do to put yourself in a more positive place where you can be more generous. And I think that we don't talk about this enough in the church, that we need to prepare, be wise, don't live above our means, live under our means, that we're able to be generous and to live that generous lifestyle. So no, you have freedom. Uh, you wanna be wise, but your choice to, let's just say something that may even be more um, shallow, than getting your nails done. Although I, I guess I, I I won't say that's not shallow. I won't I won't I won't correct you on that. Um, but no, you have you have liberty in Christ. You have freedom, and you want to give as well. But God's given you what you have to be able to live, to be able to enjoy life, and to be generous and to give to others. And then God will give back to you when you're giving to others. So I don't think it's wrong to spend it that way. You you definitely want to give. You definitely want to help the poor. Uh, you definitely want to just be that generous person because when you are, then God gives back to you so that you can be that conduit to be able to help other people. All right. So thank you. I don't think the only thing we're supposed to do is just give to ministries. We definitely want to give. We want to lay up treasure in heaven. We definitely want to make friends with the kingdom of heaven. And that's all good. Um, but you've been given your finances for you to be able to enjoy and um, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure we can get to that place where we're able to be generous because we've made some hard decisions now to be able to do the things uh, that God has called us to do. All right. So Kara has a question. Kara says, question, we as Christians, should we take a stand and sign petitions like against uh, this procedure and uh, critical race theory? Um, yeah, I don't see any problem with signing petitions as long as you agree with what <clears throat> the petitions say. Uh, we want to prioritize what we think is important, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how involved we get in other things, but rescuing the unborn, rescuing children from teaching that is just wrong they're being indoctrinated in schools and standing against those things. I see that as a personal thing that we should do. Uh, I even think that in certain ones of these things, churches should be involved in this fight. And I, and I don't know so much about CRT, although from the pulpit, we would talk about it. And, um, and also the procedure, I mean, we're saving lives. And we are to be, we're to be the light of the world. And I think that we as Christians should be involved politically um, not because we think it's the answer, but because we want to be a part of what God's given us in our government and the way our government is run. And it's, you know, and follow the laws. And if petitions can turn something over or cause a law to be signed in that would save lives or protect children in school, then I think that it's fine. All right. And, and it's okay to be, uh, it's okay to be, um, to be political. You just want to make sure that you don't let that political aspect interfere with winning people to Christ. And um, I've got family members and friends who are on the exact opposite side of the aisle from me. And I just try to keep the door open to share with them. Even when we start talking about, um, even when we start talking about politics or religion, um, which a lot of people, you know, don't want to, don't want to talk about it at all. You know, it's like, I know, let's talk about the politics of the Pharisees. Let's talk about both of them or, you know, those kind of things. So I don't think that's a problem. All right. So Psych Man has another question. Psych Man says, um, 
in Daniel 12, all right, Daniel 12, 1, 11, 12, indicate God's judgment will last 40 days. The number of judgment. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. I got to get my Bible pulled back up here. I have it in Strong's. I'm going to make sure I've got it on King, on, um, well, let's go to Daniel first. I should have gone to the other one. Daniel 12, 11, and 12. All right. Um, 40, the number of judgment. Um, <clears throat> they were, water was on the earth for 40 days. That's number of judgment. Um, yeah, rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. So I can see why people would say that. Um, 11 and 12. So I've got it up here. Let me say, let's take a look at it. Um, so it says here, and from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to 1,335 days. So I'm assuming you've done the math on this. Uh, this has always been a question for me, psych man, uh, and what exactly these days are. And I've always kind of come to the place where I'm not sure. And if there's a difference of 40 days, that would be really interesting. So I'm assuming you've done, you've done the math or did you find it somewhere? If you have a reference, if you could just add it in here, psych man, I would appreciate that of where, where you, is it a difference of 40 days? I guess it's just really easy to do the math. I mean, we could do the math, right? Let's see if I can pull this up here. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do the math. I'm going to do the math right here while we're on the air, just because I'm really interested to know um, what this is. Blessed is he who waits and comes to 1,335 days. So I'm going to go 1,300. Of course, I do it wrong right away. 1,335 minus um, 1,290 days. Minus 1,290 days equals 45. Huh. Let me do it again. Let's see if that's right. Um... All right, so 1,335 days, 1,335, did I do that right? 1,335 days minus 1,295 days. 1,295 equals 40 days. There it is. Okay, it only, I had to check my math, all right? Um, yeah, psych man, so that's interesting. Uh, 40 days between those two numbers. So this is, uh, this is yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I think very well it could. Uh, there could be something to do with that amount of time. I'm going to have to go back and, and just kind of refamiliarize myself in this. Uh, we studied Daniel not that long ago. Um, so we could go back and check on what I had taught about these days, but I didn't talk about it being 40 days uh, difference. It's interesting that I never took time to calculate that. It's pretty, it's pretty simple to calculate. Um, so God's judgment will last 40 days. Um, blessed are those who make that time. I'm not, I'm going to have to go back and look a little bit more psych man at this, um, with the 40 days. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, we will take time to look at it and I'll check back in or, or check back in with me. Ask me if I did anything, any work on that. Um, and I'll see if I can break it down. I'm tempted to do it right now when I, when I'm with you guys, but I won't, uh, we've got 12 minutes left. So I'll look at a few more questions. Um, so, uh, we have a question from Jari about the angels. It's going to be an, I don't know, Jari, it's going to be, I don't think so is what it's going to be. Question, what kind of angel is Satan? If he is a cherubim, does he have multiple personalities or is he a seraphim or an archangel? Um, I'm, I'm going to say, Jari, that I think that Satan was pretty high up. That he's one of the main angels. Like I think Gabriel and uh, who stands in the presence of God and Michael, the prince of Israel, uh, Daniel 12, 1. But we don't know anything about what position he held in heaven other than what we get out of the passage in Isaiah 14 and the one in Ezekiel. It is Ezekiel 28. I'm trying to remember exactly what chapter that is, which tells us some information. So it might be good, Jari, if you go back. It was a question from Jari, right? Yeah, yeah. It might be good if you go back 
and read them with this thought in mind. Do we know anything other about him? I'm pretty sure he was a high angel. He took a third of the angels with him. So I think that we can say pretty confidently that he was a high angel. Um, it's not me saying that he was a seraphim. Um, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project uh, does, has a whole video on this, on the seraphim and being the burning ones and the passage that talks about it. So you could take time to go and look up the Bible Project and Tim Mackey's um, uh, statement about him being a seraphim. Uh, it, it very well could be if that's what seraphim were. Um, the word for snake in Hebrew, I think is Kadesh, if I remember correctly. I might be pronouncing that a little wrong, <clears throat> but seraph is supposed to be a poisonous snake that has burns. And remember, there was a time when poisonous snakes were a plague because the children of Israel had gone to sleep with the Moabite women. And so there were burning ones, or seraphim, or not, excuse me, seraphs that came in and, and attacked them. So uh, maybe do, do a little bit of search there. Sorry, I don't have all those answers. Um, I'm going to say it's pretty high up. Probably, and I don't know if, if Michael is the archangel and Gabriel's not. I don't know if there's more than one. Some say there's three archangels, Satan, Gabriel, and Michael. Mm, I don't know whether that's really the case or not. All right, so we have a question from Jeanette. Jeanette, good to see you. Good to have you here with us. Uh, Jeanette says, um, what is your take on Matthew 27, 52, and 53? What the saints come out, when the saints come out of the tomb after the death of Jesus, did they go back to the tomb after going up to Jerusalem? Um, ah, that's a good question, Jeanette. So when Jesus is on the cross, there's an earthquake and some of the graves were opened and people saw them walking around Jerusalem. And what happened to them when were they, were, were these resurrected? Were they God giving them a spiritual body for them to be able to be seen by others who are around them? Uh, Jeanette, we just don't know exactly. It's one of those mysterious passages, um, this earthquake and opening up graves and saints being seen. It's one of the mysterious passages, but it seems to me, I, well, I think we can talk about what God was doing. What exactly was happening there? Did they go back in the grave? Did they, were they resurrected up into heaven? And maybe they were. Remember, it's during that three-day period that Jesus descends and then ascends with the saints and brings those a host of captives out of captivity. And we believe that that is him taking um, the saints, the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's comfort and bringing them back up into heaven. And so maybe the graves were opened and God allowed them to be seen because this was a matter of life and death. As people started hearing about the resurrection of Jesus, they were like, I felt the earthquake and I saw Aunt whoever, you know, Aunt Helen, I saw her. And um, so God was using it as a sign. So we know what God did with it, but we aren't told exactly what was happening there. Did they have resurrected bodies? Did God give them resurrected bodies? Um, God certainly can do one-time things. Um, Jesus was not yet resurrected, so I don't think that it could be part of the first resurrection because Jesus is the down payment to it. So it had to be something different. I don't know, were they seeing more ghosts or not? Um, I don't I don't know. Um, good question, Jeanette. Sorry that um, I, I wasn't more help on that. Although I do think God was giving us a sign that clearly, clearly God was um, showing us uh, what he has for us. So if you're joining us for the very first time, really glad you're here. If you have a question, you can write the word question down and then write out your question after it. Make sure it makes sense. And then go ahead and submit it and include the passage if you have a passage so that we could take time and look it up and see it together. So we have another question from Rod. And Rod says, um, if the sign gifts don't cease, why was Trum, uh, Troph Trophimus, Epaphroditus, and Timothy are Paul healed through a healing gift? Um yeah, if the sign gifts didn't cease. So I think what you're saying, Rod, is that someone who's a cessationist who believes that the sign gifts have stopped because that which was perfect came and that which is in part got, was done away with. Um, so I'm trying to think of what was so Epaphroditus, Timothy, and Paul. All right, so Timothy had a stomach issue. Paul, of course, had an infirmity that caused him to minister to the... Um, to the Galatians. 
All right, here's what I think. First of all, the gifts of healings doesn't mean everybody was healed. Doesn't mean they had the power to heal everyone. Faith was connected and the Holy Spirit was doing certain things, but it's interesting that the gifts of healings is both in plural and th this isn't me, this is me telling you what I've been told, is that gifts of healings they are gifts of healings, meaning that they're given for the one person and that that person doesn't have the gift of healing. We know that Paul could send his handkerchief during ministries uh, when he was working and making tents and some would receive it. We know that they put people on sidewalks for Peter's shadow to fall over it. And it seems like these were points of faith which caused them to respond. But I, I, I don't know if the apostles had the gift of healing or gifts of healings and that they could heal everyone, then why didn't they? Why didn't they go to all of the poor and all of the, or all of the sick, all of the lame, all of the blind and heal them all? Why didn't that become their main mission? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives gifts as he wills. And so I would say in the case of Timothy and his stomach, God didn't will it. In the case of Paul's, um, infirmity, Paul prayed that the infirmity would be removed and it wasn't. And so God, it wasn't God's will. Um, Tremophus and Epaphroditus, um, Epaphroditus got super sick when he was delivering the letter to Paul from the Philippians. And Paul was really worried about him and he didn't, and he didn't heal him. So this is a really good question, Rod. Um, but I think that as we talk through it, we come to the, the answer. Uh, Trophimus, I was trying to remember exactly what happened to him and I can't remember, um, but I'm sure he's like these other examples here, right? That's a really good question, but I don't think that that says the sign gifts passed away. I think that no one had the gift where they could just heal everybody. And there's no one that has had that gift today either. We think of William Branham who claimed that he had that gift and he prophesied that he actually healed people. He said, I have healed people. And he tells, told people, you are healed. And, and this will be gone. And those people still had it. So as a prophet, he ended up being a false prophet and didn't really have that gift. Um, and I don't know that anybody has had the gift. If they do have that gift, and there's those who claim that if you have enough faith, they can, and they, you know, it's a lack of faith that stops you from being healed. And these things are just wrong. They're, they're false teachings but they claim that they can heal anybody if they have enough faith. They always got an out, right, for these things. So I'm going to say that the, the gifts of healings, and you can understand why it would be gifts of healings, would be a gift you give someone, and then you give it to them later again, you give it to them later again. So someone has the gifts of healings, would be as the Holy Spirit wills, and not everyone would be able to be healed. I don't think it says anything about sign gifts passing away and not being around today. All right. So thank you, Rod. Uh, really good question. And um, really good to um, to go and think that through. All right. So it's been good um, being with you guys here today. I hope that you are blessed. I hope that you continue to love Jesus. We have a service uh, in an hour at our East Campus tonight. Uh, we have a Saturday night service. Uh, we're going to be talking about prospering the real way. The passage that we have is Jesus observing people giving in the temple and what he observed. And there's some really interesting things that are there. So we'd love to have you join us. If you're here in Tucson, it'll be six o'clock at our East Campus. Tomorrow morning, it will be um, at both campuses, East and West Campus. And um, it'll be on YouTube and Facebook. And if you guys have any questions about the study, as you're watching the study and we're talking about the, the real prosperity, the real abundant life that Jesus brings into our lives, um, then, um, then go ahead and go anywhere on YouTube and ask a question about the study. It takes all new questions and puts them into one place, new, co new comments and puts them into one place. So no matter what video you go to, you can go there and you can ask a question about the study and I'll get it and be able to cover it on Wednesday when we have our next Q and A. All right, so stay close to Jesus, continue to love him, continue to search his word, be on a truth quest instead of an I'm right quest. So much, of, so many times we're just, interested in defending our own position rather than seeing what the Bible really says and what it really means. All right. And um, I'll get my foam stacked up here better. Um, hopefully the sound is still good. Uh, we'll be able to compare this to other ones. 
Um, I think it is. But uh, God bless you guys. Uh, we will see you later. Thank you guys. Um, love you. Stay close to Christ. We'll see you on Wednesday when we have another one of our Q&A. I think it's episode 91, which is hard to believe. We've had 90. This, the next one will be 91 Q&As that we've had so far. You're welcome. All right, guys, we will see you later on. I am out.